Okay, good. Um, so we are so glad you're here, and I'm I'm really delighted to to see you all tonight. Um, I know it's a beautiful, at where I am, it's a beautiful evening, and you know pr probably you'd just soon be outside, but I'm I'm glad to be talking about wildflowers with you. So this is going to be a tour <clears throat> of some habitats, some different habitats, lowlands to highlands. So we're going to start in the water. <laughs> we're going to start with wildflowers in the water and move on up uh, to some other wetlands and then into the woods and then uh, to the top of Mount Mansfield at the very end. So the idea is that we're talking about native wildflowers primarily, though I will talk about a couple of non-native plants as we're going along, but mostly we're talking about native wildflowers and we'll be talking about their habitats, where they grow, a little bit about their ecology, um, and, you know, a little bit about pollination schemes, though that's not what this is about. It's mostly just about the wildflowers themselves. Um, but so I'm, I'm going to uh, start, um, as I say, start in the water with uh, a habitat that we call, simply call deep water marshes. And uh, so these are the habitats that we're going to cover. Um, deep water marshes, bogs and fens, floodplains and shores, wet meadows and moist edges, fields and dry edges, low and middle elevation woods, um, and finally mountaintops. And uh, this, the picture that you see here is actually a picture of a non-native plant, Queen Anne's Lace, and this is my own backyard, and that's why I've shown that picture. But we're starting with deep water marshes. And what we mean by this is places that where there, there is vegetation, there's sort of a, a, a complete cover of vegetation, um, but the water is one to two to three, up to six feet deep. And um, in this habitat, we have frag the first plant we have is fragrant water lily. And um, I'm no Claude Monet, but uh, this is just such a beautiful plant and love to see it. And it's beginning to bloom right now. It's blooming right now in, in ponds and quiet, quiet shores. This is a pond um, right, it's sort of a backwater of the Connecticut River in Brattleboro, where I was recently. Fragrant water lily. And there it is, there's its bud just beginning to open. And this is what many of them look like right now. Another water lily is yellow pond lily, and um, it, it's a it's a really fascinating plant. And both of these plants actually have underground parts, underground stems that are really great food for wildlife, very beneficial for wildlife. Another plant that grows in these marshes, one of my favorites, is coming into flower right now, um, pickerel weed. Uh, I'll take it, make a note right now that most of the slides in this show are my own, but um, a few are contributed by my photographer friends. And when that's the case, you'll see in the lower left-hand corner the name of the photographer. So this one is by John Tagliaferro, and he found a um, a, a dragonfly <clears throat> visiting this pickerel weed plant. But when I was visiting this patch of pickerel weed, again in Brattleboro just a few days ago, I walked down to a, a backwater of the Connecticut River and there were just bumblebees everywhere. They were just going crazy. And there were other things coming and going. There were dragonflies coming and going, but the bumblebees especially really seemed to um, enjoy and, and be working hard at uh, pollinating these uh, pickerel weeds. And you can see, if you look closely at the flower of the pickerel weed, it's a flower that's not exactly completely symmetrical, like a circle, but it's got a little bit of asymmetry. So the top petal, you can see that top petal has um, these two yellow dots. And those two yellow dots, it's often true in flowers that there are contrasting colors yellows and um, and reds uh, contrasting with with blues for example and those are like guides for uh, for insects to draw them in so that they can find the nectar within the flower and as they're visiting and looking for that sweet nectar and also the very proteinaceous pollen um, on the stamens they collect the pollen often for in the case of bumblebees and other bees on their legs and then move on to the next flower to get more nectar and more pollen and transfer the pollen 
and pollinate the flowers in that way. So there, this was, this was, you know, what I saw that day, just bumblebees flying hither and yon and just all, all over the place. Another thing that I saw there was this um, pondweed. And I have been asked from time to time, what's that ugly thing growing on my pond? Is that a, you know, should I get rid of that? And this is actually, it doesn't, it's not, not as spectacular looking as the pickerel weed, but this is a beautiful native pond weed and um, one of many species of the genus Potomageton. Um, again, on the slides in the lower right-hand corner, I have the common name with the scientific name underneath it in italics. And so we, we, not all the flowers, not all the wildflowers are spectacular in the same way that the pickerel weed is, but but just um, as important and vital in the ecosystem, these are all in, but also incredibly important wildlife food, um, these, these different pond weeds. Now you'll see, okay, we've started with two different plants that have the word, the, the name weed with them. So there's pond weed, pickerel weed. Well, a weed, what's a weed? I mean, what is a weed anyway? <laughs> a weed is simply a plant that's growing where you don't want it, as simple as that. And um, so sometimes people look at these and think, oh, yeah, I don't want that thing growing in my pond, but leave it there, it has a purpose. Okay, so from the deep water marshes, we'll go up a little bit to um, bogs and fens, which are, bogs and fens are peatlands. They are places where uh, the, the, the vegetation has accumulated over thousands of years to form peat, which is partially decomposed, P-E-A-T, which is partially decomposed organic matter. In this particular place, I was standing on a boardwalk, which is, which is uh, floating on top of 24 feet of peat, of partially decomposed organic matter. And this is a fen, which is a, a kind of peatland that has groundwater moving through it, and uh, calcareous groundwater in this case. And this is Chickering Bog, and even though it's called Chickering Bog, it's technically a fen. And this is owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy. So when I say, um, bogs and fens. So deep water marshes are places that you can see, you know, in a lot of different places um, easily found. Bogs and fens are a little harder to find. There's not as many of them and you have to go off the beaten path a little bit to find them. But don't go off the boardwalk. <laughs> if there's a boardwalk in the peatland, stay on it because that will protect the fragile nature of the ecosystem. But in here, um, you you could um, and and there's another bog another um, peatland that the Nature Conservancy owns where you there is a boardwalk where you can see showy lady slipper, and showy lady slipper is past flower now but it flowers in late June, so um, what I'll be talking about today are flowers that are that are visible from say mid June to late July, so a little past the flowering time of this one but. Um, but a little bit earlier. So keep that in mind for late June of next year to go find the showy lady slipper. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Another orchid growing in Chickering Bog pretty recently is grass pink. Uh, and here it is closer up. And there you can see um, at the top of the flower, there are stamens, the male uh, parts of the flower, and then the pistil toward the bottom. And again, that's sort of a landing pad for the insects. They come on and they land. We'll get uh, the pollen um, on their backs and go on to another flower and pollinate it. Another similarly set up, but, but just upside down from the previous one. This one's called Rose Begonia, another orchid um, that's gross. And you can see this right from the boardwalk in Chickering Bog. Beautiful, beautiful orchid that is flowering right now. Another thing that grows in bogs and fens is pitcher plant. And this is, um, this picture was taken in June and those dark red petals um, are gone now, but those dark red petals, which are hanging down beautifully in this pitcher plant, um, attract insects to the, to the big flower. And I'll show you in a second what they're hanging off of. And what I what I don't have a picture of here, but many of you have seen it, is the actual leaf of the plant is a is a pitcher uh, uh, which has water in it. And insects go into there 
and they cannot get out because of hairs that are going sticking down and um, they cannot get out and they're actually dissolved in there. So this is an insectivorous plant. But here you see a closer look at the pitcher plant and that umbrella-like thing, that upside down umbrella is actually the stigma, which is where the pollen lands, but it also is a landing place. It's a landing pad for insects so they can get in there and again, get the pollen and move on to the next flower. Another fascinating and insectivorous plant that grows in bogs and fens um, is this one, horned bladderwort, Utricularia cornuta. This is a picture that was taken by my friend Emily Stone in Wisconsin. Um, and it's called horned bladderwort because it has this uh, horn or, or spur on the flower at the bottom, which contains the nectar. And insects go in there to get the nectar and, and they are forced to go in and then and get the pollen and move out. But the, fascinating thing about this is that it's an insectivorous plant and under the water um, it has this this network of roots and these bladders these black bladder things that are um, that both keep the plant afloat but also trap little tiny insects like nematodes and um, and again digest them and feed the plant so why do we have insectivorous plants in bogs and fens? Well, they're pretty nutrient deprived places, particularly nitrogen is a hard thing to come by in bogs and fens. So there are a number of plants that are designed to, um, to trap and digest insects. And these are two of them. Another plant that grows in fens is water avens and a beautiful sort of pinkish red plant. There's the flower down below and the fruits up above. Another one, similar color, and this is fascinating to me that three of these plants that I'm showing you, the pitcher plant and the water avens and this marsh sink foil are this, this similar sort of pinkish red color, um, which is a color that doesn't actually normally occur in sink foils. Most sink foils are yellow. And most species of avens, um, which the previous picture was, are either white or yellow. But the ones that grow in wetlands are this reddish color. I don't know why. If you can tell me, I'd love to know. Another plant that's fascinating that grows in bogs and fens are cotton grasses. And there's several species of cotton grass. This one I love, love, love. It's a tiny little thing. Um, it only grows about 10 inches tall. And so these are these tiny tufts of cotton and what those are, are they're very, very modified flower parts, those, those long tufts of cotton. And, um, but they are designed, and here you see one that's sort of maturing, and you can see the, the little tiny fruits, which look like seeds, um, and they have these white hairs attached to them. And so everything is falling apart now, and those white hairs will fly on the wind and take those seeds to a new location. Here's another kind of cotton grass, green keeled cotton grass, which also grows in fens. And those are both members of the sedge family. And here's another sedge called mud sedge, a beautiful, beautiful little plant called mud sedge or Carex limosa that grows in fens. And um, I'm showing you this because um, sedges are a group of plants that are notoriously tricky to identify because there's a lot of them. Now this is a flowering plant. It doesn't look like much in terms of, you know, like in comparison of to the showy pickerel weed or something, but it is, it is a flowering plant and those are the fruits of it. Um, sedges in the genus Carex comprise um, fully one tenth of our native flora in Vermont. So if there's about 1,500 native plants in Vermont, about 140 of them are sedges of the genus Carex alone. So they're nine to 10% of our native flora. So they're worth getting to know. Um, and they're really beautiful, beautiful things. Now this is a tiny thing that that whole thing that you see is only about a half an inch long. Now going from Chickering Fen to Peachum Bog. Peachum Bog is uh, in the town of Peachum in Groton State Forest. And it is, a, um, it is a state natural area and, a, and it has a boardwalk in it. So this is a great place for you to go and visit. Love this sign with the lichen and, and uh, you know, the hand carved sign with the lichen. Fragile area, please do not litter and um, 
or destroy vegetation. It's very, very faded. And uh, somewhere else it says stay on the boardwalk. And this is a picture of Peach and Bog. Beautiful, fascinating place, quite different from the Fen. Things you could see in Peach and Bog include sheep laurel and another cotton grass. This is tawny cotton grass. And this is one that flowers and becomes mature a little bit later. This is what it looks like right about now. Um, the tawny cotton grass, but in a month or so, it will look like this. These really um, lovely tufts of brownish cotton. Another thing you can find in bogs and fens and swamps, wetlands of, of many kinds, is winterberry holly, Ilex verticillata. And uh, verticillate means in the, in the axils of the leaves or the base of the leaves. So the, um, the um, flowers are little tiny flowers, about a quarter of an inch wide, are really just tucked in at the bottom, at the base of the leaves. And they will produce red, you know what winterberry looks like, beautiful red fruits um, later on that persist through the winter. And many people um, pick them in the winter to, to make winter, um, beautiful winter arrangements. And there is a, out of focus, but there's a honeybee on this, um, on this winterberry holly. Now, um, <laughs> these pictures were taken in near Chickering Fen um, a couple of weeks ago. And I, we also have winterberry holly. Some people grow it ornamentally, and I have, we have some growing in our yard. And I tried to photograph the, um, the flowers of that um, with my phone a couple of weeks ago, but and I was sort of shoving the phone down into the leaves to get, and I got stung by a bee, and I had to kind of, had to kind of retreat from there. But um, because the bees were just working it real hard, they love it. Okay, now we're going to go to floodplains and shores. Um, floodplains are places. Floodplain forests are places where. Uh, where that flood annually, places along rivers that flood annually. This is a floodplain forest way up north in Canaan, the northeasternmost town in Vermont, and uh, the very north end of the Connecticut River. And in this photo, you can see um, the lilies. Look at all the lilies, the Canada lilies in that photo. These are native Canada lilies, one of my favorite wildflowers. They are flowering right now. And um, here's a closer look at the Canada lily. And this was taken along a river shore in, on the White River um, in July of a couple of years ago. And you can see this Canada lily, it's a typical lily flower with six petal-like parts. And um, you see how, how the red dots in the center are really concentrated in the center. Well, hummingbirds love red and hummingbirds pollinate these things. So these are adapted for, for hummingbirds to come and visit and be attracted to that red and pollinate them. Okay, now um, another thing along some shores, this is a pond shore in, in Vernon, going from the northeasternmost town in Vermont to the southeasternmost town in Vermont, the town of Vernon. And this is a little pond called Lily Pond in Vernon where buttonbush grows. And buttonbush is a fascinating plant that grows on all kinds of shores and, and really can form dense thickets. And we have actually, there's a natural community called, uh, called buttonbush swamp, which is dominated by buttonbush. Buttonbush is a fascinating plant. And if you look closely at these flowers, you will see that each flower has four petals. There's not many plant families that have four petaled flowers. And one of those plant families is actually the coffee family. I'm telling you, it is the coffee family, the same family from which our coffee comes. Um, and we have just a few members of the coffee family. It's primarily a tropical family, but we have a few members of it here in Vermont. And I'll show you another one in a sec. Another thing that grows commonly on shores is Canada anemone, beautiful native anemone. And here's, here's one that grows um, on the shores only of Lake Champlain, as far as I know, in Vermont. Um, and this is called false indigo bush, a member of the pea family. Uh, this is a native plant in North America, but is thought to be non-native and adventive in uh, Vermont. And um, so we're out of its sort of main range. And some people consider it non-native and even invasive. Um, but I, I think the jury's kind of out on that. It's not really clear. 
Now, so again, in the lower right-hand corner, there's the name and the asterisk in the, it, beside the name means non-native. And in this case, I put it in parentheses because I'm not quite sure. And there's the close-up of the flower of the false indigo bush. And this was taken a couple of weeks ago. These are past flower now, pretty much. Another thing that grows on shores is uh, hedge nettle. Um, beautiful member of the mint family. You can almost see looking at this stem that it has a square stem, which is characteristic of the mints. Another thing that's characteristic of the mints is that um, the flowers are, are bilaterally symmetrical. So again, they're not round. Instead, they have, they have like two sides, uh, two even sides. Um, and so again, it's sort of a landing pad for insects. Now, um, there's another, there's a, uh, there's a close up of a, of an, a wasp of some sort um, visiting this hedge nettle. These pictures were taken by John Tagliaferro and I, I failed to put his name there. So just acknowledging him. And then this is a monkey flower um, with another insect visiting it. Um, also common on shores, looks very similar to the hedge nettle, but this is actually in a different plant family. This is not a mint. This is in what used to be um, the larger figwort family. Um, but broken into some smaller families. Now, again, John Tagliaferro. Uh, so, in, and then another thing that grows on shores commonly is a thing called silverweed, which used to be in the same genus as sink foils. It's a kind of sink foil. There's its leaf and there is its flower. So you can see the similarity to sink foil if you're familiar with that. This is a low growing plant, um, really just crawling along the shores, but very common on lake shores, particularly on the shores of Lake Champlain. Another one that grows on shores um, is swamp candles. Now, this is, a, I love the name of this plant because it's called swamp candles. And it doesn't really grow in swamps. It grows more on shores and open wetlands. Swamps are forested wetlands. And this is, I see it mostly on, in open wetlands on shores. Um, but the name Lysomachia terrestris, terrestris means on land. <laughs> so swamp candles growing on land, eh, I don't know. Anyway, it's an interesting name, and there's a closer look at it. Again, it's got contrasting colors to draw insects in to, um, to get the nectar and then gather the pollen and move from flower to flower. Swamp milkweed is another one that grows on shores, a lovely, lovely uh, plant um, that is just, uh, just fabulous and flowering right now. And there is hard to see the uh, the butterfly up there, but that's a great spangled fritillary. And uh, the milkweed, like like the common milkweed, which we'll get to in a minute, um, attracts monarchs, but many other kinds of butterflies as well, including this great spangled fritillary. Now here we're going to move um, from shores to basically wet meadows and moist edges. Now here's a bunch of plants that you can see basically without doing much work. You can drive around <laughs> on a back road and if there's moist road edges, um, you'll see these plants. You'll see this one you probably have. It's just spectacular right now. I can't get enough of this plant. I love it. This is tall meadow rue, and uh, it's tall. It can be about six feet tall. Um, and here, you might think this is a picture of a cornfield. No, this is a picture of tall meadow rue. You see, and this is right at the Richmond Park and Ride, which is, I live near Richmond. And uh, there is a cornfield there, but there's a fence line, and it's a little bit moist there, and there's all this tall meadow rue growing right there uh, along this fence line. I love seeing it there. Again, there it is. It's like it's like a cloud of snow in the summertime. I think it's just fabulous. And if you look more closely at that cloud of snow, you'll see this. And you'll see, in this case, if you look at all these flowers and look at the parts of them, and, and in a minute I'll compare, but these are all stamens. And so these are all male flowers. They only have stamens. They do not have the female parts known as pistils. They only have the stamens that produce pollen. And um, here's a closer look at that. And there's a spider hanging out there in this male flower with all stamens. And there's a flower that has some 
other parts in it. It has some stamens on the outside, but in the center, you see those pinkish things are a little bit different. And those have a, a fuzzy part on top. And that is actually, those are actually the pistils. Those are the parts where the seeds will be produced. And the fuzzy part on top of those, the curly fuzzy part is called the stigma. And that is the part that that um, that the pollen sticks to, the pollen sticks on that stigma, and then the pollen grain actually grows down through it with a tube down through and into um, the little tiny, what we call an ovule, which is a baby, which is basically an egg, which will become a seed. And so um, this is a mixed flower, a flower of male and female parts together. Generally speaking, we think of tall meadow rue as having separate male and female plants um, but for the most part there are there are plants that are just male but there are also many plants that are mixed male and female there's a fancy name for that polygamo dioecious that'll be on the quiz another one of my favorite <clears throat> wet meadow plants is blue vervain or verbena hastata blue vervain beautiful tall plant oh it can be about four four feet tall just a gorgeous thing, and um, oops, and that was a close-up of it. Another very, very tall plant um, is, and this is about six to eight, can be eight feet tall, um, and so this is just like at eye level, I walked right up to this and took a picture of it, um, and this is that that uh, umbrella thing is called an umbel, and this is an umbel of flowers. This is a member of the parsley family, so if you think about, we saw a picture of Queen Anne's Lace, and we'll talk about that again in a sec. But um, so this is in the same family as Queen Anne's Lace, or wild carrot, or parsley, or dill, or, you know, celery. Many, many things that are in this family are, are edible. Many other things are poisonous, either to touch or to eat. It's a fascinating family with all kinds of culinary uses and you know, and all kinds of uh, dangers. Um, so, for example, there's the, a, a member of this family, um, the poison hemlock, um, not hemlock at all, but is is a member of this family, the, and that's the plant that um, killed Socrates. Um, there you can see in the, in the distance of this picture, you can see the uh, developing fruits. So this, the flowers that have, that have passed maturity and these umbels are about, um, oh, they're about six inches in diameter. They're quite large. And the reason that I say, so this is cow parsnip. And the reason that I say that it's not giant hogweed is because there is a plant that's very, very similar called giant hogweed, which is a non-native invasive plant. This is a beautiful native plant, cow parsnip. But giant hogweed is a non-native invasive plant that is a terribly, terribly toxic plant to touch. Um, it can actually cause blindness if you get the juice in your eye, and this has occurred. Um, so it's really kind of a dangerous plant, and um, but it's quite rare in Vermont so far. Um, it is spreading, but it, it, it's been seen only a little bit in Vermont. So I've had a lot of calls from people or just texts or emails or whatever saying, hey, I've seen giant hogweed, let's get rid of it. And I just want to make sure that they know that most of the time what they're seeing is this beautiful native cow parsnip and not please not to get rid of it. Um, and I'm showing you this stem of cow parsnip because it is um, it's fascinating with these sheath the the base of the leaf kind of wraps around the stem, which is a characteristic of this family. Um, but one thing about the giant hogweed uh, that's different is that it has red spots on the stem, and this one does not have those red spots. There's a couple little spots there, but the giant hogweed has, is covered with red, reddish, purplish spots. So just look for that. Um, be careful and, uh, you know, stay away from them if you're not sure, but, but um, you know, be sure to get a correct identification on them. Another thing that's a very, very tall member of the same family, the parsley family, but this one doesn't have a flat-topped umbrella. It has a round umbrella or umbel, and this is great angelica, which again has many, many um, culinary, has culinary and medicinal uses. Beautiful native plant, but again, it's eight to ten feet tall. It's a huge, huge plant. 
and uh, I, I love it because it's, it flowers in early July and it sort of reminds me of fireworks. I think it's better than fireworks. Um, meadowsweet. Uh, meadowsweet is another one that grows in, in moist places. And uh, there's a closer look at meadowsweet. It's in the rose family, one of the characteristics of the rose families. Many, many, many stamens and many pistils. So you can see how how there are so many stamens in these flowers as you look closely. And there's a pink version of meadowsweet. It can actually be white or pink, um, white to pink, I would say. Um, but a, another thing just sort of to be careful about with identification is there's this plant called steeple bush, which is a different species of spirea um, that, that flowers a tiny bit later and has um, fuzzy leaves instead of smooth leaves and a very dense uh, flower cluster, but it's easy to confuse those two because they're both pink. Now um, we're going to look at some fields and dry edges, and here we'll look at things that you really, all you got to do is drive around really almost any highway, and you'll see some of these things just, you know, they're everywhere right now, and it's just so fun and beautiful, and Queen Anne Place is one of them. And, uh, but, but let's talk about milkweed for, for a minute because it's such a fascinating plant. And this is in my backyard. I've let my yard go. I've let it grow to, go to milkweed. I've actually let my front garden go to milkweed. I love having the milkweed. I love having monarch butterflies flitting around because they love, love, love the milkweed. Um, and um, here is a monarch on milkweed. Uh, and this is actually, this picture was taken at our, um, Bluffside Farm um, property in Newport uh, on, on Lake Memphermagog. So that's a place where you can visit in the summer and see, um, see milkweed growing and see the monarchs coming to it. And if you look, and, and this is another a great spangled fritillary. So lots of, as I said, you know, a lot of different um, butterflies will use milkweed and flies and moths. Look at this. Look at all the insects that are on this, that are on this plant. Um, and that is a uh, that butterfly is a white admiral, also known as red spotted purple. Um, and there is a tiger swallowtail on milkweed. So it's a it's a plant that attracts lots and lots of different um, butterflies and moths and bees and just all kinds of insects. Very very sweet, very fragrant. And if you're walking around with, when it's flowering in a meadow of it, you know what I'm talking about. Just very sweet fragrance. And here's a close look at the flower. And this was taken in my front garden, which I'm proud to say <laughs> I've let go to milkweed. And uh, so it's a fascinating structure to the flower. Um, the petals are actually the parts that are out of focus in this photo that are hanging down. And these uh, light pink structures are, are a special structure that's meant to um, enable the insects to get in and get close. But also um, there's actually a, a slit in between each of those, each of those, uh, what they're called hoods, and between each each one of them, there's a slit that actually captures the legs of fly. If there's a fly that comes in or another insect, they actually get stuck in there. Um, their legs get stuck in there, and they have to go, like shake themselves out. And I've actually seen this happen. I don't have a picture of that, but I've seen that happening. You just have to shake themselves out. And in the process, you know, they're gathering a lot of pollen and moving it from place to place. So it's another trick. So another beautiful um, roadside plant, but a native plant um, is evening primrose. And uh, one of the reasons that I'm showing you this particular picture of evening primrose is because there's a power line in the background. Um, and that's sumac in the background, which we'll talk about presently. But um, when I was um, getting ready to to do this um, talk and putting some stuff together on our website, uh, one of the one of our um, one of our people that that does our website, Nadine, said, "Oh, Liz, I need." She texted me. She said, "Oh, I, I need a um, I need a further. I I only have a close up of the evening primrose. Can you get me something that's a little like zoomed out a little?" I'm driving around Waterbury and I just, so I'm driving past this gas station. <laughs> I see this, I see this evening primrose right in the entrance to the gas station. I pull over, take the picture, send it to her. <laughs> and so it's a plant that grows in the most, un, you know, the most like what seem like just um, 
inhospitable places. It can grow out of the crack in a sidewalk, but it's a beautiful native plant, fascinating. And um, again, it's another member, uh, it's another plant family, the evening primrose family that has four petals. It has a specialist moth, and this is the primrose moth that actually specializes on evening primrose and, and goes, this, this beautiful pink moth um, sticks its nose down into the primrose and um, uh, hangs out there for quite some time and uh, lays its eggs on this plant and, and completes its life cycle. There's Queen Anne's lace. Uh, and there is, sometimes Queen Anne's lace can be pink as it's emerging, mostly it's white. And here's a fascinating thing about Queen Anne's lace that if you look closely at that head of flowers, um, so Queen Anne's lace is not a native plant, but it's not especially uh, invasive. It's very prominent on roadsides, but uh, not, not a badly invasive, and it's also not a toxic plant. Um, so, uh, but it's fascinating, if you look in the center, there's this one very, very dark purple flower that sticks up above all those little white flowers. It's a sterile flower. It does not actually produce seeds, and nobody knows what it's for. But chances are pretty good that it has to do with navigation, has to do with insect navigation to help them, again, you know, hone in on the center of the group of flowers and be as effective as possible in, um, in reaching as many flowers as possible. And Queen Anne's lace, you know, often grows on roadsides. You can see, look, you can see car, this is at the Richmond Park and Ride again. I took these pictures this morning. And, um, it's growing here with chicory, another non-native plant that grows on roadsides. These two grow together and um, they're just lovely. Uh, the, the pair of them together is beautiful. And there's chicory close up. And look, there's three things growing together here, wild parsnip, Queen Anne's lace, and, um, and chicory. Now, if you had looked at this location 20 years ago, you would not have seen the wild parsnip. It has really, really spread a lot. It is a, um, a, a native, a, a non-native invasive member of the parsley family. And it is a toxic plant in the sense that if you touch it, um, get the, the juice on your skin on a sunny day and expose that to the sun, you will get a very bad rash that can last several weeks. Um, so it has two asterisks by it. It is non-native and it is also invasive. And there's a closer look at it. Another thing, hedge bindweed. This is an interesting one, beautiful little, beautiful plant that kind of grows just biny along. It's related to morning glory. Um, and it, this is actually growing right out back of the building where I am right now, uh, the Richmond uh, Land, the Vermont Land Trust Richmond office. And um, beautiful plant, uh, it's a native plant, and um, but can be quite weedy. Uh, one of the names, one of the common names for it is, I love this, Granny Get Out of Bed. <laughs> Another common name for it is Devil's Guts. I have no idea why it has either one of those names, but look at there's a couple of bees hanging out on the, on the bindweed. And spreading dogbane is another one that's flowering right now. Beautiful native plant growing in fields and meadows, commonly on roadsides. This is this is related to milkweed. It's in a different family, but very close to the milkweed family. And you can see the pods, long skinny pods, very similar to milkweed pods, except they're long and skinny instead of instead of stout. Um, this is a, a hummingbird moth on a blackberry. And one of the reasons I, I love this picture is because I have seen hummingbird moths like this going to uh, dogbane quite a bit. In this case, it is on a blackberry. Speaking of blackberries, here's purple flowering raspberry, which is flowering right now um, and very common on roadsides. And there's its fruit, a little out of focus. And not everybody loves these fruits um, because they're a little have a lot of seeds, but I love them. They're very sweet. Now we're going to look at staghorn sumac, um, which is uh, grows um, commonly on roadsides. This is actually a fall photo, but this is a really important wildlife food. And here's um, in Mills Riverside Park in Jericho, a chickadee eating the fruits of staghorn sumac. But going back seasonally, going back a little ways, and this is back a couple of weeks now, these are actually the male flowers of staghorn sumac. So if you look at a group of staghorn sumac, they will be either male or female. And the male ones have these sort of yellowish clusters of flowers 
that come out before the, you'll see the female cones. And looking closer, you can see the stamens there. And here are the as, as a close up of the female cones with their with their really hairy fruits. But look, there are also stamens in this picture as well. So it's not pure male, pure female, but they are dominant male, dominant female, functionally. And uh, here's a here's a staghorn sumac fruit a little bit later in the season with burr cucumber. Another sumac is smooth sumac. And then here's another thing that um, where I saw the smooth sumac, and I'm back in Brattleboro now, is tick trefoil from a distance that might have looked like purple uh, loose strife, but it's not. It's a native, beautiful native plant called tick trefoil. And there's a close up of it. Look at there's a ladybird beetle on it. And there's the fruits of the tick trefoil, a little bit like a pea fruit, only with constrictions. So it is in the pea family. And this is a different species of tick trefoil. Another roadside plant that's around right now is garden valerian. And another roadside plant is soapwort and, um, or bouncing bet. And I'm just showing you these because these are visible and very apparent right now, but not native. Now into the woods, uh, into the woods, uh, here's something that's flowering right now, a really beautiful plant called partridge berry. And guess what? This is in the coffee family too. And um, so there are four petals on this. And there is a, a close up of a pair of flowers, a pair of those four petaled flowers. And you'll see the partridge berry when it actually matures, the berry um, is a red berry that comes from both of those flowers and they're merged. So there's, there's a one red berry that will come from these two flowers and it has two dots on the top indicating that there used to be two flowers there. Canada Avens grows in the woods and another one in the rose family, Carolina Rose growing in the woods right now. And look on the upper left, there's, a, there's an inchworm couple of inchworms, I think, on this plant. Another one growing in the woods right now is Enchanter's Nightshade, um, sort of a delicate little thing. And this is related to the evening primrose. It's in the same family. And this one, instead of having four petals, it only has two petals. Two sepals, two petals, two stamens. Another thing growing in the woods now is Self Heal or Heal All, a member of the mint family grows along trail sides and road sides. It, it's a little bit, seems a little bit weedy, but it's actually a native plant. And its name, self heal or heal all, indicates um, that it actually, it has medicinal uses for a number of purposes. Also growing in the woods now, uh, pyrola, a shin leaf or pyrola, and another kind of pyrola, one-sided pyrola. And there's a close up of it. And another member of the, um, these are all members of the Heath family, and another one, beautiful one, called Pip Sisawa. And this is another photo taken by my friend Emily Stone. And look at the close-up of that beautiful flower. Just a fascinating thing. And those stamens are really unusual and interesting. Those pink things are stamens that open up at the tip. Another thing that's closely related is what we call ghost pipes or Indian pipes, just emerging from, from the forest floor now. And another, finally, another thing in the woods is wild leeks. Um, wild leeks produce their leaves in profuse, profusion, abundance in, in um, early spring, but it's not until now that the flowers are actually produced. So the leaves come up, do all their photosynthesis and completely die back. You cannot see the leaves now, but now the flowering stalks are coming up. And finally, we're gonna to go to the top of Mount Mansfield um, where I'll show you just a few fun things. And this is, uh, you know, to end the, end the story here, um, some of these things have been very, very easy to find just by driving around and this, Getting up to the top of Mount Mansfield requires perhaps a little bit, mount work, a little bit more work um, to hike up there, um, or you can cheat and use the toll road. <laughs> but um, but it's uh, what what a treasure awaits you up there. Um, it's just a wonderful treat to be up there and see all the native wildflowers from mountain sandwort to mountain cranberry.
alpine bilberry these are things you will not see anywhere else i'm telling you you won't see them anywhere else in vermont alpine bilberry except a couple of other mountains and look there's an insect going inside there that bilberry which is a kind of blueberry it's related to blueberry so you recognize that kind of urn shaped flower another thing on the top of mount mansfield is this very rare bigelow sedge this is one of the very rare plants that grows up there Another thing growing up there, because there's so much moisture, this is, we think of this as a bog plant, but there's a lot of moisture and in fact, a lot of peat on the top of Mount Mansfield, um, just spongy, mossy soil. And this is Labrador tea. Take a closer look. Another member of the Heath family. And finally, um, small cranberry growing, <clears throat> not finally, um, almost finally, small cranberry uh, growing in the wetter places on the top of Mount Mansfield. This also grows in bogs, um, but, it, but it grows commonly on the top of Mount Mansfield. And actually the skinny leaves to the left of the flowers belong to the cranberry, um, but the other leaves behind it, the larger leaves belong to a plant called leather leaf, which is another member. These are all members of the Heath family, the blueberry family. So it's a common family in bogs and fens and on mountaintops. And that's because it's well adapted to wet soils. It's well adapted to acidic soils. It's well adapted to very harsh conditions. And many of the members of the family have evergreen leaves, um, which, is, which is important in very cold climates so that they can start photosynthesizing as soon as sun is available, as soon as the snow, um, as soon as they're uncovered from snow uh, in the spring, they can get going with photosynthesis. But this is a fascinating um, plant because it's a member of the genus Vaccinium, which is the same genus that blueberries belong to. But this one is a, in a different part of the genus and um, it's the cranberry part of the, of the genus. Um, and the name cranberry, you see those stamens gathered into a sort of a cone in the center of the flower. Um, when they're really tightly gathered, they remind people, they reminded, well, the first settlers in the Plymouth colony um, in what is now Massachusetts um, looked at these and, and they were introduced to this plant by the native people um, because of its edible fruits. But when they looked at the plant, they thought that it looked like a crane's bill. And so they called it craneberry and that became shortened to cranberry. And that's the cranberry that we know. This particular one, the small cranberry is not the cranberry of commerce, um, but another species, the large cranberry is the one that's grown commercially um, in um, primarily in the coastal plain. But there are people in Vermont who grow them now as well. Now, finally, finally, um, this is, this is a habitat that's on the top of Mount Mansfield, which you can see right from the trail. You don't have to get off the trail at all. And please do not go off the trail when, when you're up there. Um, but you can see these things from the trail. And these are hare's tail cotton grass. And I'm ending with this one because, well, look, look, actually, you can see out of focus to the left of that cotton grass, there's some sedge, just like the mud sedge that I showed you earlier. But um, as I was hiking around on the top of Mount Mansfield a couple weeks ago, um, and I was looking at the flowers and taking pictures of them, more than one person walked by and said, oh, did you see the truffula trees? <laughs> and they thought these looked like truffula trees. And the, the trail steward thought so too. Oh, did you get pictures of the truffula trees? Now these things are about eight to 10 inches tall. They're just like mini truffula trees. And so it was real pleasure seeing those and learning that name for these beautiful things. So with that, I am gonna um, give you a few minutes for questions. And I really, really appreciate your um, hanging out with us here and um, joining us and joining us to enjoy some summer wildflowers. So please, please feel free to, Maya will, um, Maya will answer your, or direct your questions. Toward yeah, th thank you so much, Liz. Um, we do have a few questions here. And again, um, for folks that have other questions coming to mind, please use the Q&A tool you see at the bottom of your screen. Um, to send those over to me. Um, here's one question from Kathy who asks, how did the non-native plants come to be here? Yeah, good question. So there, most of the non-native plants that we have here 
came in a couple of different ways. Some of them are from Asia, some of them are from Europe, um, mostly from the Northern Hemisphere, um, from places where the climate is similar. Um, Eastern, uh, the Far East were um, in Japan, Eastern, Japan in particular has a climate that is really similar to our climate. And there's a whole set of species that grow there that are very similar um, to and have analogs here. Um, like there's another maple, there's there's, but in any case, the climate is similar but if you have a plant that's growing there, it, it has over time evolved a set of controls so that it doesn't get too abundant. There, there is, uh, it might have insects that keep it under control or, or something like that. Those plants are introduced to this area um, and become really abundant um, because there are no natural controls on them. So that's one way some plants were purposely introduced. Um, other plants have come over unintentionally and, and not purposefully um, in seed uh, in that that was brought over um, or you know with plant material, just little seeds uh, attached to plant material. So a lot of different ways, sometimes accidental, sometimes sometimes intentional. Great, thank you. Um... Let's see, we have another question here from Nancy who asks if she can find slash put pickerel weed in her man-made pond. Find or put pickerel weed in, in her man-made pond. Um, yes, you can certainly put it there. And I do not know where you can purchase pickerel weed, but I'm pretty sure that you can. There are nurseries that sell aquatic plants that um, native aquatic plants um, that will grow nicely in your in your pond. So that's a great one to plant in your in your pond for sure. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a quick question from Dottie who just asks where um, Chickering Bog is located. Oh, sure, yes, absolutely. So the Chickering Bog is owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy, and I'm I'm grateful to the Nature Conservancy for it. Um, it is in the town of Callis. Um, you go out through East Montpelier to get there. And if you just go to the Nature Conservancy's website, you can you can get directions to it. And if you really want to know, you go to a place called George Road, at intersection of George Road and Lightning Ridge Road in Callis. And uh, there's the parking area for Chickering Bog. And then you'll have to hike about, a, it's about a half hour hike from the parking lot in. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a question from Michael and, I'm not going to say the um, the scientific family names because I'm going to totally butcher them. But he's asking about Indian pipes and what family they're in. Yeah, so it's in the family called the Monotropa mon Monotropaceae fam. It, it's a family that is closely related to the Heath family, and or the blueberry family. So the flowers are very similar in structure. And one of the big differences is that the the ghost pipes or Indian pipes uh, do not photosynthesize, so they're um, they they um, receive their nutrients from the soil. Great, thank you. Um, and a question from Trisha, who says that she's spread hundreds of milkweed seeds in spots around her property, and few of them seem to thrive. And she's wondering what's going on there. Yeah, and I don't know much about that. Um, you know, there's places where milkweed does well and places where it doesn't do well. And um, mostly where it does well, it needs a little bit of moisture, not super, super dry, um, but kind of medium moisture. And if there are other plants that are more aggressive, if you have things like reed canary grass, for example, um, is a very aggressive plant um, that will that will take over in places and not let anything else grow. Um, I think that in my experience, the best way to get milkweed to grow is to do nothing and it'll find its way there. Um, as, I, as I said, I've done that in my, in my actual perennial beds. I've just sort of let the milkweed take over and, um, and it does naturally come in there and, and seed itself in. Great, thank you. Um, and a question from Julie, who's wondering how drought um, has affected the blooms. 
has affected the has affected just like kind of generally wild wildflower blooms this year. Yeah, um, something it's interesting. Some things are most of these these species that I'm showing you are doing just fine, and I have not seen much in the way of drought um, drought response um, in in any of these plants really that that I because in the places where they grow there seems to be enough moisture. So um, yeah, I haven't seen much of that. I do see that from time to time in very, very dry years, especially late in the year, you'll actually see plants that are, that seem to be um, withering or seem to be not, not thriving, not doing well. But frankly, I haven't seen that in the woods yet this year. So it seems to be okay so far. Um, and that question from somebody who's asking, is cornflower another name for chicory or something ah, yes. different? It is. Yeah, cornflower is another name for chicory, but cornflower is also another name for um, what pe some people call bachelor's buttons. So that name cornflower is used for different things um, in both cases of the same kind of color of blue. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and then Jessica asks, is fireweed the same as tick trefoil? Ah, good question. Yeah, so that tick trefoil that I showed you, looks a little from a distance like um, purple loose striped, and it looks a little from a distance like fireweed. But no, fireweed is actually in a completely different family. It's in the same family as the evening primrose. So it actually has four petals also. Um, if you, so if you look closely at it, you'll see that it has four petals, whereas the um, four equal petals, whereas you look closely at the tick tre trefoil, I showed you some close-ups of that. That is a member of the pea family, and it has that that bilaterally symmetrical flower that looks like a pea flower. Easy, easy confusion. Um, the next question um, is from Lisa who says, could you talk about a bad one, the garlic mustard, which is blooming right now? Yes, garlic mustard is blooming right now. It's mostly gone past flower now is in, in a seeding, is, has gone to seed. Um, flowers a little bit earlier, but it's got a little tiny white flower. It's in the mustard family. Um, there's a lot of mustards out there right now. Garlic mustard is an invasive plant and invades natural areas, including forests. Um, one thing that I have learned about garlic mustard recently is that it actually hurts more. The science has found that it actually is more harmful to pull it than it is to just leave it alone. So um, in a natural setting in a forest, it will eventually die out their finding. I know it's very like hard to have the patience for that, but scientists at Cornell University have been studying it and finding that over time it does naturally uh, die out in natural settings. And if you try to control it too much, um, you're actually kind of egging it on in a sense. So, so there's some thought that it's maybe worse to try to pull it and control it. And I think, Maya, it is, um, at least by my clock, it's about 8 o'clock. So let me just go to the last slide and then um, to, so if you can talk about future events and then we can take a few more questions for a few more minutes if people want to stick around. Yes, that sounds great. So um, we do have a few events coming up here on our calendar, um, a couple of um, old forest events. Um, and then just I put a save the date for our um, annual celebration, which is happening September 13th. Um, and you'll also see a survey pop up on your computer when you exit the, um, the Zoom app. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about this event um, to help us inform our future events. So thank you in advance for taking our survey and for um, joining us this evening. You're welcome to drop off at this time, but we do have a few more questions. So Liz and I will stick around um, sure. to answer those. So thank you so much everyone um, for joining us. And um, the next question, another question about mustard, is the coffee family similar to the mustard family? No, it's a really very distant, they're not related much at all. They both have four petals, right? The flowers have four petals in both the mustard family and the coffee family. Um, but other than that, they're not closely related. And as I said, the coffee family is largely a tropical family. There are many, many, many members of the coffee family in the tropics. It's a huge family there, very small representation here. Great, thank you. Um, and Missy asks, where does Joe Pieweed fit in? Yes, yeah, so I didn't I didn't show Joe Pieweed or Bone Set or Goldenrods um, because those are just beginning to come into flower now and they will be coming into flower. Um, so I think of those as more sort of late summer fall wildflowers. But yeah, Joe Pieweed 
will come up in, and I would put it in the wet meadows category of, of habitat. Um, if we were to add it to this um, group of plants that we've been talking about today, it likes wetter meadows, wetter fields, and um, not super wet necessarily, but it does grow in marsh edges. And um, just be I'm just beginning to see it come into flower now. We do have some other uh, wildflower talks on our YouTube channel. Um, and there is one about fall wildflowers that we did last year, which um, you can go back to and learn more about. Joe pieweed um, and goldenrods and asters and some of those things that are just starting to come into flower now and will be more prominent in September or so. Great, thank you. And I'm putting a link right now to our YouTube channel um, in the chat. So if you're interested in checking out some of the other videos we have there and this video, um, this webinar will also be um, posted there in, in the next few days. So if you want to go back um, and watch again, you're more than welcome to. And this is actually our last question um, from Grace and Bob, who um, just want to be reminded, what was the name of the very colorful moth? Well, which one? There were a lot of colorful <laughs> moths. <laughs> I'm not sure. There was a pink one, which was the oh the the pink one was the was the primrose moth. Um, so that bright, lovely pink one that was on the evening primrose might be what you mean. Yeah, because the other colorful things were butterflies actually. So that's probably what it's meant. Great, thank you. Well, that is all we have for questions. Um, so thanks again, um, folks, for sticking around, and thank you so much, Liz, for a wonderful presentation. Um, and have a great night, everyone. All right, thank you. Have a great night. Thanks.